All right. So once again, welcome back. So today we're going to be looking at additional customer transactions. So the main chunk of this actual chapter is pretty much revolving around what happens when a customer um, wants a refund or if they just don't want the product anymore. So that's one of the assumptions that we have to know and we have to deal with when, especially when we have customers. You sell a product or a service to them, they can, uh, you know, they can no longer like the product or they want to have a refund, et cetera, et cetera. So the one thing that we have to make sure that we do before anything, before we can set that um, return is to create some kind of company return policy. So for example, since we are a um, service-based company, right? It's, mo it's mostly uh, photographies and stuff. Um, I'm not quite sure how they would want to do this, but for most of the cases, um, I believe the return policy is based on the products that you sell. Um, it just depends on your company. Once again, like if you, if you, if you, um, consider like a service, something that's refundable, right? Customer satisfaction, 100% guarantee, money back guarantee for whatever reason it is. Okay. Now, well, for 100% for most cases is that a lot of oftentimes, you know, if customers buy some a product from you and they don't like it, right? The assumption here is that you also have to expect that customers will return the product, whether it's uh, because they don't need it anymore or whether they don't, um, they don't like it, whether it's too expensive, they thought about it. So there's many, many reasons to why a customer would want to return a product and that's where we're going to be introducing to you um, how to create a customer refund slash also known as a customer um, credit memo okay so when we refer to returns and allowances it's going to be straight away a credit memo now of course there's there's this is where uh, we get to take a look at what happens when we issue a credit memo what do we do with it Right, and it's going to be based on what the customer wants. So once again, this little section here tells you that these are some of the reasons that you may come into conflict where a customer wants to return a product. So again, if they purchase the item and they don't like it, and they return it, or maybe they bought it in advance and they cancel it. So cancellations. So if you uh, remember yesterday or on Monday, cancellations. This is where you do the cancellations. Okay. Um, it's also um, when a customer makes a return. And here's another quick little overview of how to use the credit memo, right? Um, another one is if a customer decides to overpay for the bill. Yes, it is common because sometimes um, it might be easier to write a flat check. And what happens is that or um, maybe... They didn't know how much their actual bill is. They didn't check it up, so they just wrote out a check and just sent it out. And you look at it, and you're like, oh, here's your extra money back. Yes, you can issue a credit memo um, if a customer decides to overpay. Okay, but most common ones for credit memos are usually um, when it comes to... Um, customer satisfaction, but if they were to decide to return a product, that's the most uh, common one you would use it for. And last but not least, here's something they didn't list out, but one, the last thing that you can use a credit memo is to write off bad debt, okay? And that's what we're going to take a look about today as well, okay? So here they give us an example to go ahead and issue Mr. Bob Mason a return or a refund. So once again, um, obviously the transaction must happen prior. Um, and let's go ahead and see where we can find that issue refund. So right here on the home page, you have refunds and credits right here. Okay. You also have it up in the um, customers and in the customers uh, menu bar. Okay, you can issue um, a credit memo slash refund. 
okay? Um, you can also find that same thing on your income tracker, right? Because it's kind of dealing with um, primarily your invoices. So if I go to income tracker, I'd be able to find it down at my manage transactions, right? Credit memo slash refunds, okay? Um, and um, when we go to the customer center, whether it's through the home page, icon bar, or menu bar, um, of course, right, the basic three ways that you can um, enter in a transaction here is by going up to the top to the new transactions. There it is, credit memos. Okay, and then of course, if you right click, you can also create a uh, credit memo here. Let me locate it, credit memo. Okay, and then of course, on the manage transactions, you can also issue the credit memo here. All right, and then of course, this one has the special, special um, last one. The last transaction that you can do is like what the book says is you're going to locate the actual bill. So in this case, I'm going to search all and I believe it's for the, the invoice 3947, right? We double click on it just to view the invoice. Okay, once again, the yellow uh, bubbles are just to indicate to you what's new with the invoice. But notice this. We see just the invoice just as is, right? Mr. Bob Mason purchased 30 um, standard photo paper from us. Okay, so what we can do here is at the very, very top of the window, okay, you have um, record, uh, receive payments, and you also have the refund credit, okay, also known as your credit memo. So if you click on that, so that's seven ways to be able to enter in a transaction, right? Homepage, menu, um, income tracker, right? Then when you get into the customer center, you have the new transactions at the top, you have right click on the customer, and you also manage transaction on the customer. And last but not least, you have the refund, return refunds um, or slash credits at the top of an invoice. Okay. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click it because that's exactly how the book tells you to do it. And notice this, now the form becomes a credit memo. And because I selected the person, right, Mr. Bob Mason, now it's pulling up his exact invoice, okay? So here you can either, one, uh, refund for the whole amount, right? So that's what this, that's what QuickBooks is assuming. It's assuming that when you are creating this credit memo, that you're essentially going to either refund the entire product or whatever that the customer purchased from you. So in this case, right, we learned that you can modify once again, right, in this case, right, we can modify the form at any given time. In this case, he's returning only 10 of those items, okay? And of course, I'm gonna go ahead and say here, return or refund, 10 photo paper. Or standard. Okay, so here that's just to make us to keep and make a note there. Once again, thank you for your business, right? This item is taxable, okay? Now, of course, because the item is taxable, notice this. It collects the tax on top of that as well, okay? So this one is automatically, it's going to take away the tax that's associated with this product. So right there, and of course, like I said, I've mentioned this before, QuickBooks is going to automatically revert the tax for you because here it's calculating that, okay, well, this is the tax, 
So in this case, you don't need to enter in a tax item because it's already calculated and it's returning or refunding the tax for you. Okay, once you've checked everything out, and I believe this was um, done on, I believe, February, February 15 of 2019, February 15, 2019, all right? And here is a common rule or a suggestion, I would say. Now, when you issue a credit memo, you wanna make sure that it's associated to the actual um, invoice itself. So in this case, it's telling me that I'm running a new invoice. Well, that's not what I want. So let me let me go ahead and shrink this table real quick because I need to check up what that account, what that um, invoice number was, okay? So here, I'm just gonna sh uh, shrink down my uh, window. So this was invoice number 3947. So usually what they recommend you to do is, in order for you to recognize that this credit memo belongs to that, invoice is to associate it to that invoice and add a letter C for credit. Okay, that's just rule of thumb, right? You could do R for refund, right? Whatever it means for you to be able to recognize what those letters mean, right? Every company might have different um, ideas, right? A for allowances, uh, C for credits, um, R for revised, you can do whatever it is a uh, letter that you want to use. But in this case, they associate it because it's just easier to remember. Okay, so you have an invoice number 347 and then you have a credit memo 3947C. Okay, and again, once again, this allows you to link this credit memo to that particular invoice. Okay, so there everything looks good. We're refunding a total of 130 three dollars and eighty cents to mr bob mason so let's go ahead and click on that save and save and close okay you get that beep of approval and now here it asks you three options that you can do with this credit okay first option is to re retain the um as an available credit so what that means is that if I retain this as an available credit, that means the next time Mr. Bob Mason decides to buy something from us, we can apply this as a, um, as a customer credit, right? As in um, something that he can use the money to put into another uh, product or service, right? So something that, um, you know, for example, right? You go to um, any store you and you try to return a product and they give you a store credit card. That's exactly what this is right here. They're not giving you the cash back, they're giving you a store credit card so then you can use that for a future purchase. So that's exactly what retaining the credit is for, okay? Of course, you can also have the option to give a refund, meaning you're going to issue them either a check, right? Most cases it's check, you never send money in the mail, but you're gonna be issuing a check and you're gonna give them their money back. Okay, now of course, this option is only if Mr. Bob Mason had made an advance payment or he made a payment already. Now in this case, um, little you have, to, you have to already know that this bill has been paid for already. Now, especially let's say they place this on an account, um, you shouldn't be able to give them a refund at all. Okay, if they haven't paid you because that's essentially giving them their money that they haven't even paid for. All right, and then last but not least, you could either apply it to an invoice. So once again, um, most cases, right, and we're gonna take a look at this as well. What does it mean to apply to an invoice? So here, once again, if someone owes you the money, they haven't paid it for you yet, that's where it comes into play where you need to apply it to the invoice. So it's, and then issue them out a new invoice that reflects the new account balance. So they pay for whatever they owe. Okay, so that one is also more commonly used as well.
Okay, so once again, um, if they haven't paid you yet and um, you apply to their invoice, therefore it shrinks what they owe you on their original invoice and you just send them a new one. Okay, usually you do. Usually you always send a brand new invoice with the corrected amount, including the refund. Okay, and then for this example, we're going to be issuing a refund. So we're going to click on give a refund. And when we click OK, another box pops up. Okay, so what this is, is we're going to be sending Mr. Bob Mason a check, right? We want to make sure a few things are true, right? We want to make sure that um, the check is written out to Mr. Bob Mason. You want to make sure that it it is the method is a check, right? If they paid with a credit card, then you can either reissue it back to their credit card, okay? Other than that, right, you have the amount, okay? Um, and then, of course, you have the date, which is going to be the uh, what date you want to make the check available for. Always make the check available at least a couple days um, in advance, because you never know, right? Uh, when you send the check, it could be stuck in the mail. It could almost never get to the customer um, or, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? Anything can happen in the mail. So you want to definitely make sure that it goes out further. Or if you decide not to print it today, then you choose a later date. But in this case, I'm just going to keep the date the way it is. You definitely want to make sure that this is from your checking account. Okay, because you don't want to make you want to make sure that you issue things that comes directly out from your checking account, and it gives you your account balance as well. So it says, "Hey, you actually have enough money to issue this guy um, a refund." Of course, address is there. He belongs to the San Jose location, and here it is. Okay, memo here says forty twenty six thirteen. It's up to you what you want to write here. Um, uh, I guess I could say, uh, refund for invoice, uh, number three, nine, four, seven, um, give, give, give a, give some kind of memo so that when you do issue this check, right, this check, this piece of information is written on the check itself. Okay. And of course I want it to be printed later. I don't want to print it now, so then I'm going to click OK. All right, and then you're going to get that beep of approval, and now your invoice is done or your credit memo has been issued. And notice this. Why is it my, um, why is it my invoice reflecting any different? Because we decided to give a refund back. He's already paid for it, right, as you can see right here, uh, Mr. Bob Mason. He, um, it was for a total of one, uh, 40139 and he made a payment of 401039 So therefore, this invoice is zero. So therefore, once again, you can't apply it to this invoice just because he's already paid for it. So what you can do is you're going to issue um, your credit memo as a refund because it's already been paid for. Why would you reduce it? Okay. So there you go, there's that, and let's check this out here, right? You click on Bob Mason, boom, you have your credit memo right there, and it's associated to this exact invoice, all right? And again, you can double-click on it and view it however you'd like, all right? Now, the only problem here is that if you modify it, unfortunately, you have to go, you know, cancel your check, right? We know how to avoid a check. Because, you know, then you owe more money. But once again, once a, a customer is set with their refund, usually the second refund isn't going to happen because it's like, well, dude, you just already returned 10 items to me. You're going to return 10 more items to me. It's kind of kind of fishy. So in this case, there's the refund credit memo to Mr. Bob Mason, right? And it says... It's good to go. Okay. Any questions on issuing a credit memo? No 
Right, it's pretty straightforward, right? And you can do the same thing once again. If they decide to cancel an order, you can use that as well, right? You use the apply、um, to invoice, okay, to cancel the order, okay? If, if they decide to pay, if they overpay, right, then you just issue them a credit memo, right? That's gonna be give a refund, and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this one's pretty standard, right? If a customer returns a product, you pretty much fill out the information how much is the product worth, and then you issue the refund. Okay, any questions? Okay, I believe you guys said no. So, next section we have here is going to be writing off bad debt. So, here's one thing that you also need to know. Yes, you have customers, but the worst thing about having the,、um, you know, the availability for customers to go ahead and place everything on an account or owe you money is that you are potentially at risk if a customer decides to fault on their payments, especially when you, know, it,、um, you don't know what the customer's going through, right? Every customer has their own. Situation, right? Whether it's financial, okay? So maybe they can't、um, pay for anything that they owe,、um, especially like if there's a recession, you know, or、um, they lost their job, or they filed for bankruptcy, right? Or they just simply just don't want to pay. Now, you have those customers that simply just don't want to pay. And again,、um, the, the terrible thing about、um, Writing off bad debt is that you have to be responsible, okay, to、um, understand that there's a risk, right? But also, you're going to be the one that's going to be going after them and hassling them to make a payment. So, after you've completely exhausted every means, right? Let's say they owed you for six months now and you finally gave up on them. Then that's where you could be like, well, there you go. I assume that they're never going to pay me, right? And that if that's the case, then I'm going to go ahead and write off this bad debt. Now, again,、um, that's why a lot of debt collectors, right? Whether it's Visa, MasterCard, or any major credit card companies, they pay, you have to pay them the big bucks because they're the ones that are going to be responsible for collecting the money. Um, for you. Okay? So, with that being said,、um, writing off bad debt, there's two ways, okay? When we learn accounting, there are two ways that you can write off bad debt. One is called the direct write off method, which is used for tax purposes only. And that's exactly what the book tells you because QuickBooks. Is mainly geared towards to help you file for taxes. Okay?、Um, so, especially with knowing that QuickBooks behind the scenes is actually supposed to be a tax accounting s、um, easier way, right? To help you file for taxes. Okay? Now, with that being said, that means they validate the direct write off method. I will teach you the direct write off method because, in case one day you guys want to become a tax accountant, then this is definitely something you should know. Plus, you may be tested on this, okay? Because you are certifi- certifying for QuickBooks. Now, I'm also going to teach you another way, which is called the allowance method, because I can't assume that all of you are going to be tax accountants at the end of this class, right? Because you have to pursue a lot more than that. Um, you have to go through a CPA. You have to go through, um, you have to go through、um, the ethics chapter. If you don't go through the ethics chapter, you for sure cannot guarantee to be、um, a tax accountant.、Okay. Um, but also than that,、um, so I'm going to assume that you guys are most likely going to start off as a general accountant, or you could be responsible for just accounts payable, accounts receivable, general ledger. Okay, so I'm assuming that you're going to be just a regular accountant. So, with that, by、um, the、uh, rules of GAAP, 
right? The generally accepted accounting principles, you are mandated to use the allowance method if you are not the tax accountant, okay? So on the daily, as a regular accountant, you're gonna be using the allowance method. And I will teach you both of them today because we need to be able to assume that you're not gonna be a tax accountant, but we also have to assume that you're being tested on being a tax account, uh, on the program itself. So first things first is, um, so we're gonna teach you how to use the direct write-off method. Okay, so this is where you're gonna make notes. So very first thing that you have to know or recognize is before you even start to write off any bad debt, you need to check two things or create two things. So in this case, you need to create an, an account to hold your bad debt. So I go to my chart of accounts, right? And I'm gonna go ahead and search it up just to see if I have it, right? Um, this item is called bad debt. And here it is, bad debt expense, right? It's already pre-made for us, okay? If you click on it, obviously it's an expense, right? Um, it's going to um, pretty much, uh, this account is going to be um, you writing off your loss, okay? So we have it there, okay? So with that, you always need to make it an account first. And then now we're gonna check if we have the item because when we, when we do our forms, we're looking for more towards our items that we're gonna be util using. So in this case, I'm gonna check my items list to see if I have a bad debt item. So I could just take a quick glance here, right? Um, um, I don't think I see bad debt, but you can always search it once again, search it. Uh, but of course the book tells you you're going to be adding a new item. So here I don't have a bad debt item at all. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and create a new item because I need to associate uh, or link up my items to my accounts when I'm issuing that or writing off that loss. So here, the one that they tell you is it's going to be considered an other charge, okay? So other, other charge, okay? So it's an other charge. Okay. Um, and then it's going to ask you that it is going to be the item name, which is going to be bad debt. Okay. Um, it's not going to be associated to, um, to, it's not related to another account. So I'm going to leave this section blank. And here it tells you, do you, are you going to write off a specific amount? In this case, no. You, you're not going to write a specific amount because it's going to be different per customer, right? You may take off the whole amount, take off a percentage of amount, or even um, take off half of it, right? You just don't know. So in this case, we're not going to take away anything. But the assumption here is your items could be taxable or non-taxable. So if I'm going to be writing off my tax, like we saw before, right? Therefore, you want to make sure that that tax is there, okay? And of course, the account that we're looking at here is going to be um, the bad debt account, right? That's the account that we're utilizing to place our um, loss, right? So here, bad debt account. And I click on it and I'm gonna click OK. So now I've created my bad debt, okay? So those are the first two things that you must do before you write off your bad debt. You need to create the accounts and the items that are associated with the bad debt, okay? And then now we may proceed. So in this case, when we're issuing or trying to write off our bad debt, we do it exactly how we make a refund or a uh, return. So in this case, whichever way that you can go ahead and make that refund for, right? I'm just going to go ahead and click on 
my home page, right? I'm going to create a credit memo. Okay, here it is, my credit memo. Okay, and this time I'm going to go ahead and uh, look up the specific invoice slash specific person, right? In this case, it's going to be um, Anderson Wedding, Kumar and Sati, right? Kumar and Sati. And it should pull up, right, when you go into the next tab. How come it didn't go in through... Anderson Wedding, Kumar, and Sati. I'm going to click tab. No. Hmm. It's not pulling it up for me. Usually it's supposed to pull up for you. I'm going to click no. So let's see if I have to go through the customer center. Okay. Uh, Kumar and Sati. Okay, here's invoice number 4003. So here it is. Um, okay, so there, here we're going to write off the whole entire amount for the $190. Once again, uh, I could do that through this, right? Click that refund, and it should create the credit memo and pull all the information. That was really weird. I don't know why it's supposed to. It's supposed to bring everything in unless I tap the wrong person, okay? But yes, here it is. And now the credit memo section is here, right? So instead of the 3947, right? This is the invoice for 4003, right? And we're going to associate it once again a C because we're going to um, credit this. Now, again, I can do B for bad debt, right? All right, whatever you want to associate it with because I'm not giving this them a credit. I'm writing them off as a bad debt. So whatever method that you use to associate this with, once again, you could choose whatever you'd like. Um, the date for here, I believe, is the 17. Okay. And then now you see this right here, right? That you're going to uh, take this... Um, indoor photo session now this is where this is where you need to uh change the item here because we're not doing this as a photo session what we're doing is we're going to transfer this into the bad debt item okay right you see it like that and then i'm going to go ahead and then it's going to give you an error message saying, hey, I hope you know that you know that this is um, an expense account. And, of course, we know. We're writing it off. And, uh, of course, um, there's no tax on this, right? So it should be for the 190 So make sure that you associate that there is no tax on this item, okay? And it's for the $190. Now, of course, item is $1 and it's going to be for $190, okay? And there you go, you fill it out, so that means you're writing off $190 for this um, write-off, okay? Once again, it's not taxed because it's a service, right? They just purchase the photo sessions from us. So in this case, there's no tax because it's service. We, um, so there is no tax that's gonna be reverted, okay? And of course, I'm gonna go ahead and indicate here in my memo that I am writing uh, to write off bad debt for invoice number 4003. Okay. Once again, once everything looks pretty top, pretty. Um, when everything looks pretty good, right? We have our items here. We have that um, we're getting rid of, and it, we're, instead of a photo session, we're writing it off as a bad debt, and so on and so forth, right? Service, because there's it's not a taxable item. We indicate that's one for $190. And I'm going to go ahead and click that save and close. 
Once you get that, now you have the options. Are you going to give a refund or are you going to apply it to the invoice? In this case, I'm going to click apply invoice. And when I click that OK, okay, it's going to get, tell me, well, which invoice are you planning to apply it to? Once again, as you can see, um, this one pretty much looked up the um, item for you because I looked up by the person's name or by the customer name. And I'm going to go ahead and check mark that. Okay, make sure it's checked mark. If you don't check mark it, it's not going to work. So there you go. I check marked it. Okay, and I'm going to click done. Okay, now your invoice populates once again back up and it shows you this here. It shows you that the Kumar and Sati, right, their bill was $190. And now that you took the credit, right, now they owe you $0. Okay. And what you're going to notice this here, so I'm going to go ahead and click save and close. Now that that's zeroed out, there's a credit memo here, right, zeroed out. If you go to your bad debt expense um, account, you're going to notice that now you have an account balance in it. So misspell that. So let me clear it out. And you want to type in bad. Here you go. If you if you um, once again, because it's an expense account, you can you can only view it as a quick report. So if I double click on it, it will give me a format right there. And I'm going to say all transactions. And here you go. You have a credit right here for the 4003 for the $190 that you've written off. OK. So any questions on how to write off bad debt? Now, that one is for the direct write-off method because we directly took off from the account receivable and we placed it directly into the bad debt expense. Okay. Any questions? So on the end of the year when you do your taxes, you report this as a loss? 100% yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, again, if you are the tax person, right, it's going to be automatic because when you file your taxes, it's going to automatically register as a loss. Now, as a regular accountant, you do need to take a couple more steps and a couple more measures for you to be able to properly write off the bad debt. Now, the assumption with the allowance method is that your customer has the potential or um, I guess yeah potential that they could make a payment okay so we're gonna create what's called a um, a placeholder account for you to move the amount that they owe you and place it into the account until you exhausted every means and every methods to try to collect that money now, with that being said, of course, you know, give or take, if you're the kind of person that just says, okay, if they didn't make a first payment, then I'm going to assume that they're going to never make a payment at all. That's a bad way to look at it because you never know, given the circumstances, right? Why? You would also contact them. Why haven't you made a payment? Okay? And when you come to that conclusion, then when you decide when to actually write it off, whether it's at the end of the year or at the end of a given period, right, right, depending on how often you write off your bad debt expense, right, you can only go up to maybe 5% or 10% of your total account receivables. So in that kind of perspective, right, you can't just write off debt whenever you feel like it, right? You can, you have to place it in the placeholder, wait for, you know, however months, right? And then you can assume at the end of the given period or at the end of the year, usually commonly happens at the end of the year when you've exhausted all your energy and you cannot collect that money, then your assumption is you're going to write it off as a bad debt. Okay? So let's, any questions on how to write off bad debt using the direct write-off method?
Okay. So since this part is going to be taken off from the books, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and create an invoice. So then I can show you the example on how to write off the bad debt for um, the allowance method. Oh, did the wrong one. So here we're going to pick on Mr. Bob Mason once again. So here's Mr. Bob Mason. Okay, class is going to always be San Jose for this guy. Okay, San Jose. Okay, now this invoice is going to be different, significantly different. Now I'm going to make this transaction, let's say, happen um, on the 1st of January. Okay, I'm going to call this um, uh, invoice number 5545. Okay, and let's say he bought um, outdoor photo sessions. And let's say he bought three of them. Where's my quantity? Quantity is three. So therefore, Mr. Bob Mason owes me a total of $285. Okay. Once again, thank you for your business. And then here, three hour out. photo sessions. Okay. I have to create the invoice first so that I can show you how to utilize the allowance method. Okay. So there you go. I'm going to go ahead and save and close. Okay. And now let's go ahead and utilize the allowance method. So once again, first rule first is you need to create an account okay, to recognize where this is going to be, be the placeholder. Okay. So once again, we're going to go down to the accounts and we're going to create a new account. Now for the allowance for doubtful accounts, it is going to be a contra account to the account receivable. Now what is a contra account for those who don't know? It is going to be essentially um, an account that decreases another account. Okay, so it's an opposite direction. So con the, the, hence the word contra, right? Opposite. Um, okay, so in this case, now I don't want to associate this with an account receivable amount because it doesn't increase my account receivable. So what, how I have to recognize this is it has to be considered an other asset. Okay, because once again, if I associate this as an account receivable account, that means I'm essentially, I'm increasing my account receivable. In this case, I'm not. I want to decrease it. So I have to associate this as an other asset. Okay. And I click continue. And of course, okay, um, you're going to, right, uh, you don't need to assign account numbers just yet because, um, or you could, right, I can say this is account number 199. 100, okay, and then the account name is going to be the allowance for doubtful accounts, right? My description here is going to be um, when customers, oh, no, sorry, when accounts receivable becomes uncollectible debt. Okay. That's pretty much, that's what you got to do. Remember, it's a placeholder, right? It's something that happens during the year or whenever a customer shows tendencies where they're not making your payments. So in this case, I need to create an account to, um, to allow 
that my accounts receivable, right, when I do my monthly reports, I can show that that part of the money shouldn't be counted as part of my actual income because this part is, um, you know, money that you're not able to collect. So therefore, on your reports, that's why it's very important that you create this because uh, when you do your income statement, right, you're reflecting on what uh, people actually owe you and that are paying. In this case, this is a placeholder account for you to create. So then if and when those customers do not pay, you move them into another account. Okay, so there it is, the allowance for doubtful accounts account. Okay. And of course, the next thing that we got to do is we have to create our item. So once again, it's going to be very similar. Um, and then, but the only difference here is it is going to be um, an other charge. Okay. And it's going to be the allowance for bad debt or the allowance for doubtful accounts, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to shorten it, okay? And once again, of course, there's no dollar value. You can subject to be taxed, right? And of course, the account that you're going to associate is going to be the allowance for doubtful accounts. Here it is, the allowance for doubtful accounts, okay? And I'm going to go ahead and click OK. So now that we have my account set up, and we have the item set up, right? Now, let's go ahead and proceed with the same exact thing that we were looking at earlier, okay? So once again, I'm just gonna go through the customer center and issue the uh, refund here since I know who, right? Bob Mason, right? We're going to uh, do this for uh, the invoice, this one, okay? Um, and, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and create that credit memo. Okay. So by looking at the invoice, right? So let me, let me shrink this so you can remember this since I'm able to look at multiple windows at once. My invoice, right? Is for the total amount of $285. So once again, you're going to do the same thing, except this time, let's say it's already the end of February and he hasn't even made a payment at all. Or in this case, we could even make it March. We could say it is March 31st and he hasn't made a payment at all to me. Okay? And of course, we're going to name it as 5546. Oh, no, no, 5545 B for bad debt. Okay, I'm making that up. B for bad debt, okay? And again, we're not going to take away, we're not gonna credit him for this. We're going to take the item, right? And we're gonna associate it with the allowance for doubtful accounts. Right? Allowance for doubtful accounts, okay? Once again, um, it's non-taxable, right? It's a service item. You're going to do not three, but one. And I believe it was for the grand total of 285. If there's tax, of course, it would be written off, right? But in this case, it is exactly for the 285. And again, if you need to double look at that one more time, okay? You'd be able to do it by pulling up the invoice for down below, right? In this case, it is for 285. All right. And again, instead of this right here, I'm going to say to write off bad debt for invoice number 5545. Okay. All right, and now I go ahead and click on that save, and then now it's asking me, well, how, what do you want to do with it, right? Bad debt will always, always be applied to the invoice. So then you're going to click OK, and then once again, you get that same exact window. 
it's going to say, well, are you looking for this particular invoice right here, number um, 5545? And I said yes. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and click done. So once again, it's going to automatically apply it to the invoice automatically. So as you can see here, right, we originally owe 285, right? Right here, you have payment slash whatever uh, credits for the 285, and that's how you zero it out. Okay, and let's go ahead and save and close. Okay, and once again, it's going to be now into your actual um chart of accounts under the allowance method. Now, what do I do? How do I write it off? That's where you're going to come to the conclusion where you need to exercise using the journal because um, the bad debt account is going to be considered an adjustment to, um, it's going to be considered an adjustment to the company. And it's going to be considered an adjustment entry. So as you can see here, we have a total of $285, right? If you check your accounts receivable, so accounts receivable, you're going to see that right here, it's subtracted out to 85 because we no longer have it anymore, right? Mr. Bob Mason decided to not pay and we can't assume that he will pay. So here it automatically updated your accounts receivable saying that now that person doesn't owe you that money anymore. Right now it's under another account that's suspended, right? Or in this case, we're waiting for him to make another payment. Okay. Now, like I've mentioned before, now the next step is, well, how do I write it off at the end of the given period? That's where you're going to go to your journal, right? Um, and we're going to create a general journal entry, okay? Because in this case, I have no write-off bad debt um, form I can fill out. In this case, I actually have to create an adjustment entry. So um, I would have to change the date and make it March 31st, okay? And what I'm going to do is exactly how we journalize, right? We're going to journalize our debits and we're going to journalize our credits, so then our accounts balance. So in this case, for any reason that you decided that um, I no longer need the allowance for doubtful accounts, I need to write it off, what you're going to do is you're going to create your bad debt expense, right? You're going to locate it in the bad debt expense, and then you're going to create it as a um, account. Now, once again, this is going to little going to be diff. Uh, this so you have your bad debt expense and you have your allowance or doubtful accounts account. So once again, this will make more sense when we dive into chapter thirteen. But for those who've been with me, you guys are pretty straight forward, uh, straight straight. You guys know this part. How do you journalize bad debt expense is what you're going to do. You're going to debit whatever it is that you have, and you're going to credit whatever that it is you have, and that's how you make your adjustment entry. Okay, so once again, I'll show you guys this in Chapter 13, but that's what you generally have to do when you've created your allowance for doubtful accounts and you need to move from one account to another. You would have to... Um, recognize that it's going to be a debit to the bad debt expense and a credit to the allowance for doubtful accounts. Okay. So any questions there? So when you use a journal, the purpose of a journal is to move um, things from one account to another. All right. In this case, that's what QuickBooks uses the journal for. It's to either create your open balances or to move information or um you're from one account to another account. That's what the journal's for. So in... But every time you have a transaction, excuse me, uh, it, it goes automatically to that account or you have to uh, do it manually? Okay. All right. So if you're doing manual bookkeeping, you come here to the journal. Now, like I've mentioned before, QuickBooks does majority of all the transactions behind the scenes. So as you saw behind the scene, right? All I did was write a credit memo. And it did the accounting behind me, right? Uh, it it yeah. it 
took away from my account receivable account, right, the 285, and it added it into my allowance or doubtful account. So remember when we saw that? Um, so that's associ that's exactly what we're doing here, is that now that it's been debited to my allowance or doubtful accounts account, now the next thing I have to do is I got to move this amount into my bad debt expense account. All right. And in order to do that, because there's no window, there's no proper window for you to be able to do that track transaction, that's where you have to use the journal. So that's so uh, when you write off bad debt for using the allowance method, you have to do double the work. Okay. Mm -hmm. But for tax purposes, right, it automatically written it off as a loss and it went from the accounts receivable, right? We saw that negative 190 and it dropped it immediately into my bad debt expense account. Okay. All right, any questions there? No? Yes? No questions? No. Okay, so there we go. We got to take a look at how to write off our bad debt expense okay so I believe the next section we have in the book is to create our customer statements okay, so let me go ahead and find that section um, collecting sales tax I went a little too far okay one more okay Creating customer statements, okay? So this one is pretty standard, especially when you own a company and you have your customers, right? You want to make sure that you issue them a list of all of their transactions. So a common one that you normally see, right, is your credit card statements, right? Um, because if you're the customer, right, and you're using their credit card, trans credit card, and you owe them money, right? Every month they send you a bill showing you a list of all of your transactions, how much you owe, and what amount is due, okay? So that's precisely the same exact thing here, except, of course, we're looking at the vendor standpoint, right? We're the ones that's creating these statements for our customers, right? The purpose of it is to show our customers two things, right? A list of all of their transactions, the amount that they, and, and the amount that they owe to us. Right, whether it's um, so in this case, uh, it's not a monthly payment, it is um, known as a um, in this case, they owe us based on 30 days, right? Well, we give them terms, so they didn't finance their charges, okay? But you can do that so as well, right? So in this case, uh, when we do our um, statements, we get to see how we can create them per each customer and recognize how much they owe us. And you can view all their transactions as well. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. So customer statements, okay? There are only two ways to create a customer statement, okay? Everything else is going to be creating a statement per Customer, so I guess okay. Never mind. Scratch that idea. So I guess you could actually create um, statements. Um, there are pretty much three ways. Then okay. So once again, you have the first one right here. You got statements on your home page. Pretty straightforward, right? You also have, if you go to your customers window, right? You have the create statements up here as well great statements, right? And of course, if you go to the vendor, I'm sorry, the customer center, you can also create statements per person, okay? Now, these ones are going to be considered reports. So when you click on run report, you're essentially creating a statement for them here. But you can also right click and be able to create the statement for them too, okay? So those are technically uh, three ways that you can do. Now let's go back to the home page, but 
here's the difference between when you're creating the statement using the home page because here it allows you to create state uh, statements for every single person in your quickbooks all right so you get to do four or five statements at once where if you use this the the customer center right you can only do it individually so that's why you would definitely want to use this one either on the home page or the menu bar. So once again, here we are looking at our little form and usually this is what you're going to be asked. First things first is when are you going to um, create the statement or in this case, what's the statement due date or um, what's the last transaction that you're going to um, have records for each customer. Most cases, it's always going to be the end of the month that you're creating the statement for. Okay. So in this case, I believe um, it is going to be March 2019, right? 31st of 2019. And it's going to ask you, well, what kind of statement do you want to pose the, the transactions to be? So in this case, I want it for, I'm going to do a of three month um, overview of their transactions. So I'm gonna go ahead and do um, January 1st all the way to uh, March 31st. So I'm doing, I'm doing quarterly statements, okay? Every three months, there's a new statement. So here, March 19, 31st, okay? So I'm doing quarterly statements, all right? And here's a few things that you, you want to do. I'll allow open transactions as of statement date. Mm, uh, I, I don't think you have that checked marked. Now, here's the list of what you want to do. First things first is, would you like to create a statement for all customers? Yes, you do. Okay. Or do you want to create um, statements based on multiple customers so you get to select the people right if i click on here i get to select who i want to create them for i can even do one person right if i want a specific for one person okay, if i just only want bob mason's statement i can just create for bob mason right or i can also go by customer type Right, so remember uh, when we associate our groups of customers, right? You could associate what kind of um, uh, what kind of uh, group that they belong to. So in this case, I'm going to select all of them. Okay. Now, um, again, you have preferred statement method. So how are you going to send it? Again, you can definitely change that. Okay. Um, but for most cases, you probably are just uh, going to mail it out. Usually that's typical what you do unless you select that you want them to be considered, um, what is it, paperless statements, okay? But of course, you're going to have to select those specific individuals. But most cases, it's always mailed out, okay? Now we're going to go ahead and move on to the right side because the right side is what's going to be very important for you to know. So the first section here is going to be um, what kind of template you're going to use. Once again, we're going to, we talked about that in chapter um, chapter seven, customizing your templates. In this case, I'm just going to use the standard Intuit one. All right. Now here's also the important thing that you want to check mark here too is when creating one statement. Okay. You want to make a, a statement per customer, right? You don't want to link other customers because they have personal information. So it's kind of, you know, that's kind of an obvious one. So I want it per customer. Okay. Show invoice item details. Yes. I want to make sure that each customer doesn't get confused. And if I send them a statement, right, I want to show them what they charge, where they charge, and, you know, how much they charge and what did they purchase from us. So in this case, we definitely want the item details on each statement, okay? Uh, print statement by billing address, zip code, and account. Yes, you definitely want to make sure that you're going to print it out to their billing address, okay? Print due date on transactions. 
Absolutely. You don't send a statement if you don't recognize what they owe you. Of course you want to print the due date on there. Okay. Now here's a section where it says do not do not create statements. Okay. So here with zero balances. Of course, you don't want to send your customers that have no balance with you. You don't want to bother them with statements. You should only send the statements out to people who actually have account balances. So in this case, definitely I do not want to create statements for people with um, zero balances. Okay. And then here it says with a balance less than. Okay. So again, if you have a particular group that doesn't that have account balances, but it's not significant enough for you to send a statement, you can choose that. But in this case, I already chose that. I don't want to send it to anybody that has a zero balance. Other than things says no account activity. Absolutely. You don't want to bother your customers who, who did a service with you a year ago. You don't want to bother them and say, hey, your statement is zero right now. No one, a customer is definitely not going to like that. Okay. Now you can send a promotional flyer. That's acceptable, right? To kind of want them to come back to you as a customer. But you definitely don't want to send your customers who don't have any activity with you, whether it's a year ago, six months ago. You don't want to send them anything. All right. And then um, last but not least, for inactive customers. You definitely don't want to bother people whose accounts are inactive. If they cease to exist in your company, why bother them with a statement? Makes no sense. So therefore, you definitely don't want to um, send anybody that has an inactive, that who's inactive, a statement. So once you toggle all of that, let's go ahead and preview it. Okay. And here is how it looks, right? You can click on them, right? I have one, I have one, two, three, well, it's supposed to be four. I have four total statements. And if you need to take a look into details, you just click on them and here they are. So this is um, Miranda's Corner, right? They've done these transactions, right? The amount that is due is $1,191, okay? Um, and then, of course, if I go to um, this person here, Mr. Um, Bob Mason, he outstands us, owes us $776. But look at the transaction details. So once again, each transaction has details of what they purchased from us. Okay. So in this case, right, they purchased an outdoor photo shoot, right, three of them. Right. And it gives you the price points, too. Right, and again, the amount that they owe is here, okay? They owe us $776, of course, okay? Um, and even down below, right, you have information such as current, all right? Um, their one to 30 day uh, past due, so he doesn't have anything past due. Okay, but he still has an outstanding invoice. Okay, and of course the amount due is for the $776. So again, he did a lot of transaction, right? We even have the um, incense, right? Where we did the fake invoice for the $285. And of course it's subtracted out on his um, billing statement. So he doesn't owe us that anymore because he failed to pay for it. So there you go, that's how you go ahead and build a statement. Now, of course, if you're gonna customize it, you're gonna have to customize it through the um, templates, right? You know, if you're gonna do, use your company logo and whatnot, once again, that is chapter seven. But in this case, this is just the standard statement that you would typically get from any company, right? Because it's the standard one that it comes free with this um, program. So there you go. That's how you create the statements here. Now, of course, these statements, right, if we're issuing them as of 331, right, March, that means most of these bills are overdue. 
So the great thing about that you can do here is that you can attach finance charges um, for not uh, for having late overdue balances. So this is where you're going to go ahead and click this assess finance charges and then it's going to ask you this window and you can click say okay. So once again, you can access the finance charges through either, right, when you're on that window, you can click that assess finance charges. You can also do that up here in your, um, in your, uh, cancel. You can also do that in your customer's menu bar, right? If you go to customers, right, um, right underneath um, statements, you can assess finance charges, okay? Or once again, if you saw that familiar window, it is can it can be located under your edit preferences, okay? And it's going to be under customers uh, or statements. Sorry, statements. Or sorry, finance charges, right under your company. And here it is, the same exact window. So here, as a company, we can overall give some kind of charge, okay? So again, uh, because if, they're, if the person is, um, haven't paid for their bill, you can assess a late fee, a charge, um, an interest fee, Okay, because as like what I've mentioned before, if you're allowing to um, have your customer owe you the money, then therefore you can direct whatever amount that you want to assess. Now, of course, when doing this, of course, your customer has to agree. Okay, but most cases, uh, customers, they don't read the fine print. They don't, they usually um, for the credit card statements, right? When you receive your first application, right? you're obligated to know that they're going to charge you X amount of interest for any account balances overdue. So in this case, it's the same exact thing here, right? We're going to be issuing each individual who still has an account balance that's overdue, we're going to issue them 10% interest, okay? And again, the minimum for that is going to be $1, Okay, so that means they have to have a dollar in their account for me to issue them the 10% um, interest, okay? Grace period, zero, right? Grace period, right? So this is where you um, allow your customers to take advantage of a zero APR. In this case, there is no grace period, right? Especially when, um, you know, you give your customers terms, right? You gave them incentives to pay off their bad debt. I'm sorry, to pay off their debt that they owe you. In this case, I give no, no um, grace periods, right? And of course, the account that's going to be associated, right, is going to be interest income, right? Because it's interest that you're counting as revenues, right? It's you're increasing it because this has nothing to do with your sales, right? You don't owe the interest. You're collecting the interest because you said so. You said that, hey, your agreement is that if you're going to owe me money, I'm going to be subject to, to charge you a 10% finance charge for any accounts that are overdue. All right, so therefore, interest income is where you're going to be collecting that money. Okay, so once again, it says finance um, or uh, your charges over on over account dues. That is correct, and you definitely want it on the due date. All right, and then they say okay, so I click okay, and then now once I click that okay button once again, another window should pop up. Okay. All right, there it is. Here it is. Here's the other window. Now it's telling you, well, um, Miranda's Corner, Bob Mason, okay, and uh, Maria Cruz Branch Opening all owe you significant amount. And look, they calculate the 10% off of it automatically. So in this case, 10% is a lot, okay? Now, especially because we don't finance it with them, 
So therefore, the percentage is going to be charged automatically based on the overdue statement, right? Because we gave them 30 days. They didn't make the payment. They agreed that they're going to get charged 10%. So in this case, boom. That's a lot of money that we're going to be collecting for them because, once again, we already gave them terms, right? We gave them an incentive to, make them, to have them pay. We also gave them 30 days to pay, all right? And because of that, we can... Are we are allowed to charge these amounts? So make sure that you check mark all those people. And of course, I'm gonna go ahead and click save and close. Now, what you're gonna notice is that if I go ahead and go to my preview, right? Now my accounts balances have changed because I assessed an, um, a finance financial charge. So let's see, let's go ahead and go to um, this person here. Um, they still owe us the $776, but what you're going to notice is that because the statement, right, that's the statement due, that's what's due. But if you look carefully, right, you're going to see that we assess the financial charge, okay, for that, um, for that, amount that we charged them for okay so any questions in regards to doing that okay uh, okay so it's pretty much if we know how to put the information in they could they'll do it all for us correct okay. so that's that right there and i'm going to close this section out now for those, I'm going to go ahead and do a little side note too because your book doesn't actually show you how to use it. But I think it'd be definitely interesting for you guys um, if you have this little window here. So we had to activate this. So that's why it now appears on the homepage that you could assess your finance charges. And it's going to take you to the same exact window. It's going to give you um, this right here. Okay. So therefore, that's that right there. Now, here's something that you also should know again is that you're going to have this little window called statement charges. So if I go ahead and click on this and I get this weird looking register kind of looking ordeal, right? I can select each individual customers if I'd like, right? So example, I can I'm going to type in Bob Mason once again. Ooh, I got to clear this out. I just want Mr. Bob Mason. There you go, Bob Mason. All right, if I click on him, this is a list of his accounts receivables. Now, the reason that you would use this finance charges is for one thing only. If you have anything that you want to tack on such as a monthly fee okay so for example right or let's say he um i don't know you have some kind of agreement that you that if for for any reason that they choose to um have an account with you therefore you can charge them like a, a charge like a monthly membership fee, right? You could do that. That could be included onto the statement balance versus you billing them separately with an invoice. So that's a perfect example right there. Maybe you have to be a member in order for you to have an $8,000 credit. So by them, that's a monthly fee that the customer has to pay and you don't need to invoice them for, right? It could just appear just on their statement. If that's something you want to do, then you can go ahead and create that account on here and it's going to appear on their statement. So once again, right, let's say um, it's the month of June, or I'm sorry, it's the month of March, right, and you want to charge them a monthly fee for a membership due, okay? Then you can tack it on here and it's going to adjust your um, account receivable because they're responsible to have to pay for that monthly fee, Okay, so this is going to be in addition to the finance charges, right? Because monthly, monthly uh, membership is completely separate, right?
right? And you can charge each customer per basis, right? Especially like if you have tiers, right? If you have a gold membership tier, that means unlimited returns, unlimited access, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? Or maybe you have lower tiers, right? Then you can go ahead and create this statement charge so that each per customer is going to be aware of whatever account whatever amount that they owe us because you're essentially you're tacking on an additional charge so as you can see here look we uh we charge the finance charges right for a hundred and um seventy three dollars okay okay because that's how much they owe us. They outstandingly owe us that much money, right? They owed us $776. Now they owe us $950. Now, once again, most statement charges don't appear on the statement just because it happens after the statement due. So you know how you have your current balance and then you have your actual statement balance? That's the same thing there, okay? So once again, if you need to tack on any additional um, fees, that are standard or like that stays um, the same. So for example, membership dues or an annual fee for having an account with them, you could go ahead and create that individually and select your individual uh, members that have, or your customers that have those types of fees. Okay, so that's what this is used for. Okay, so once again, um, because your book doesn't show you how to do it, I'm not going to show you how to do it either. But it's definitely something you should know. Like, for instance, like, in case you do set up a company, right, and you have gym membership dues, right, you could go ahead and, um, you know, send your statements to your customers based off of that. Okay? Any questions there? Okay. All right. So um, let's see what's next. Next is going to be dealing with your state taxes, or I'm sorry, your sales tax. Okay. Now, once again, if you are a, a store, you are obligated to have to collect sales tax. Now, once again, this was also a glimpse that we got to take a look into chapter seven, right? When we dealt with items, right? We got to take an example to look at how to create our um, Nevada and our Clark County state tax or sales tax, right? Now, since we've already talked about that, therefore, I'm going to skip that section because we know how to create a sales tax item, right? We can also create a tax code, right? So we talked very briefly about this, um, but what a sales tax code does is, let's go to list. Okay, if I were to go to uh, my sales tax code, okay? So what this entails is what items can be taxed, okay? So for example, if you sell alcohol or tobacco, that's a completely different tax number, right? It's a, it's a higher tax, right? Those things can get special taxes. So you can create um, a tax item or tax code for, um, for alcohol or for tobacco, right? Though I believe they're like almost 30 something percent, right? So that's that. Or for example, you are a grocery store, right? You have taxable items, right? Your non-perishable goods are going to be considered your taxable items. Anything that's a food-related item is going to be non-taxable. So therefore, you can create a tax code so that if you do open up grocery store, right, you can mark which items are taxed and which items are non-taxable. So in this case, right, for this example, we do provide a cert, we do provide a product that is taxable, but we also provide a service and services are non-taxable, right? Because it's based on someone's time. And on top of that, they can earn commissions or they can earn tip on it. So therefore, service can not be taxed, 
Okay, we even have out of state taxes, right? Um, if this case, in this case, if this um, company is located in Northern California, right? We can accept, you know, other other states. Like, what if what if us in Nevada we decided to say, hey, um, I decided to have my wedding um, in Las Vegas, but I live in San Jose, right? And I say, so I'm gonna borrow you to drive me all the way down to um, uh, to Nevada to do it. Well, obviously, but you're still purchasing it in California, so that's a bad example. But let's say someone in Vegas, right? They they see that you had a wedding. And they said, oh, you're a photographer. How much is your services? Then you can charge them out of state tax if someone in Nevada decides to pick up your services. Okay, so then again, that's going to be considered a out of state tax code. So again, they're going to be very very specific for in each item, of course, um, that you sell. Okay. Again, government, right? If you're a, um, if you're uh, part of the service, right, you get special taxes on that as well. Okay, so there's a lot of tax codes that you could create, and I just gave you a couple examples. I'm not going to spend the time to actually do an example because um, it's pretty straightforward. If you just go in, it's like um, entering in any item, right? We've already entered in an item. This is going to be identical. You're going to click that. Um, uh, tax code at the bottom you know click new fill out the information and it's pretty straightforward right so that's what a tax code is and that's we already know how to enter in a sales tax item so we can skip all of that now the next section is going to be managing your tax okay so here you can click on manage sales tax here on the home page you can also um, go to your uh, vendors, right? Click sales tax, and you'd be able to manage your sales tax there. And, of course, if you click on this window, right, you're going to notice it's going to pop up this, okay? So those are the two, these, this is what it looks like when you manage your sales tax. Okay. So the first thing it's going to ask you is how would you like to set your preferences, so once again, if you click on this, it's pretty straightforward, right? You can find this by going to the edit preferences sales tax section, right? Do you charge sales tax? Yes, we do, okay? And then we're gonna also fill out some more information such as what are your sales tax items, right? So you can create your items in here as well. You can create your sales tax codes as well, right? Your most uh, common sales tax um, item in this case, is mostly like going to be um, Santa Clara because like you're you do more better at the San Jose location. Your sales so far are mostly from San Jose, so again, Santa Clara would be your probably most common um, tax item that you use, okay, or tax code. Okay. Then we're gonna go ahead and go down here down below. So it says here. Um, for items that are taxable, what kind of tax code would you use? We would use tax, right? Because we've already said that this is the one that you tax everything on, sales tax. Okay, so you would use that. And then again, for non-taxable items, right, such as services, right, which is our primary um, item that we have here, we're going to go ahead and click on service. So it's already set up. Now, once again, down below here is going to um, pretty much tell you how you're going to be making your payments to the government. Now, most cases, a lot of companies, right, they do direct transfers or electronically funds transfers. So they make it a lot more convenient and make it a lot more easier for companies to, um, you know, send over their sales tax. Now, how often do you pay your sales tax, right? Depending on the company that you are, most cases you may have to pay monthly depending on how small you are. But if you are a very, very, very small company, you might be able to get away with sales tax quarterly. Annually is if like you rarely have sales and you only have sales on a particular season. Then annually would probably be the best bet for you. For mo but for most companies, Monthly should be the most frequent common one that you would normally see, okay? 
So that's just setting up the preferences for the sales tax. So then every time I issue a, a sales or I do a service, um, it's going to appear so. All right. And of course, when if you guys remember, when we set up the sales tax item, we also set up the vendor information, right? We set that, well, this is who we're going to make payments to. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to um, show you that sales tax item. So if we go to Contra Costa, right, we double click on it right here. We said we're going to make payments to the state of equalization, okay? So it's important that you associate who you're making payments to, okay? So I'm making it to the state of e the state board of equalization, okay? And of course, with that being said, you also need to set up your information. So again, everything is going to come into um, you know, you have to do things prior before you could successfully be able to complete a transaction. Now, of course, um, in, you have to be able to look up who your tax agency is, right? And here, if I click on State of uh, Board of Equalization and I double click on them, here I have all the information, including the account number that I'm going to associate with to send my money forward to, okay? Plus, I have the address in case you're going to send a check. Okay, this is where they're located. Okay, and yeah, and so forth. So you have to fill this out before you can create the tax item. And then, of course, by having this vendor here, right, and you enter in their account information, this is you making your connection for you to set up your accounts so you can properly pay them. Okay, so all of those needs to happen. But once you get that, then making the payment is really easy. You just go to manage your sales tax and you click pay sales tax. Okay. Or once again, you can go to vendors, right? Vendors. Um, go to sales tax and you can pay sales tax. Okay. So pretty straightforward. If I click on pay sales tax, you're going to get this window. It's going to be really quick, simple, and easy. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and select to say, okay, well, I'm going to make a payment to the Santa Clara and I'm going to make a payment for the Costa, the Contra Costa. Once again, what is the date that I'm going to make the date, the check available on? So once again, I'm assuming this is going to be for um, March 2019. Okay, March 31st, 2019. Uh, once again, show sales tax as of this date. Okay, that's fine. You can ignore that. Uh, but make sure that you write a check, right? It's from your checking account and that you're paying off these two um, sales tax that you owe. So in grand total, you owe $499.31 worth of tax. And once I look, everything looks good. It's to be printed. So again, it's going to be waiting in my printer. Then I'm going to go ahead and click OK. All right. And of course, that's it. You just you just sent a check out to either the printer and that's how you make a payment to your taxes. So once again, if I go ahead and take a look in my checking account, you're going to notice this. It says I paid my tax payment. OK, I paid my tax payment in grand total for three hundred and ninety four dollars here. Um, okay, so I think I've just, yeah, there it is, okay, your tax payment. So that's how you make a tax payment. You can actually physically do it in here, but the proper way to do it is to just use that sales tax to pay the sales tax window because, once again, it's just a lot more easier, and that way you don't have to make adjustments or fix anything. And on top of that, your tax that you're collecting, right? It's automatically when you create every sales form. So the way that you pay for the tax should be the same exact as if you were entering in a bill, right? In order to reduce your accounts receivable or accounts payable, you need to click on those exact options, which is right here for accounts payable. You need to do the bill payment. 
for accounts receivable, you need to do the receive payments window. So same thing goes here. Your sales tax, for it to be to reduce the amount that you owe, right, or that you're collecting, you need to pay through the sales manage window. All right. Any questions there? Sales tax is an obligation that you must pay um, for every company, right? So other than that, um, yeah, other than that, any questions there? Okay. So right now it's 1010. I only have like maybe one more concept to go over. So since we're going to end class early around maybe 1030-ish, can I, I'm just going to borrow a couple more minutes of your time. So let's go ahead and talk about one more section, which is the report section. So as I've mentioned many times before, right, you're depending on what position you have into the company, whether you're a sales representative, the account accounts payable um, person, like you, you're in charge of making bill payments, right? It's going to be significant to what kind of report you want to run. So in this case to today, right, our chapter was dealing with our customers, but it's also dealing with our sales, right? So here I can run any sales report that I'd like to answer a particular question. So let's take a look at the options I have under sales. Sales, right, my reports under sales could be, right, I could do sales by customer, sales by items report, I can even do sales by representative, right? Because we have two people, right? Mike Mazowski and Katie Reynolds. We could do anything there. We can even create a sales graph, right? To see, to determine how much sales we have. And you can separate them by class as well, all right? So I'll go ahead and show one brief example. So let's say um, sales by item, okay? All right, here it is, right? I only sell these particular items. I'm gonna go ahead and click all. So here's the items that I sell. So in, under my inventory, I sell um, these digital cameras, okay, right? And you could see a sales report saying, well, this is how much you've uh, sold, okay? And you can toggle by the date too. Say, I only wanna look at January sales. If I only wanna look at January sales, then I'm gonna go ahead and click on here and um, toggle the date. Let's say I only wanna look at January sales, so January 2019. Here we are, January 1st, 2019 to January um, 31st. I can look at a specific time period that I want to look at my report for. Okay, so close, here you go. Or I can even do, let's say what happened, or let's do, let's do this one. So my monthly sales for this, right? And I'm gonna go ahead and click on that refresh button and it shows me here, this is what happened for my January sales. So I sold only these items, right? Okay. So it shortened up my list as you saw before, right? It was really long, now it's shortened up. So that means this is what I sold in the month of January. Okay. Pretty cool. All right, and you can move the table over again. Okay. So that's that. Okay, so again, each report is going to answer a specific question. And as an accountant, your main questions are not going to be dealing with sales. Your main questions are going to be dealing with your internal accounts itself. Like, what are my account balances, right? A person who's in charge of accounts payable, their main concern is, what are my vendors? How many vendors do I have? How much do they owe me? right? Anybody that's in charge of account receivable, once again, is going to be focused primarily geared towards their customers. So if I click on here and click customers and receivables, this is what I can run on reports. I can do an account receivable uh, report, right? I could do customer balance report. I could even do open invoices, like who owes me money, right? I can even do um, my uh, let's see, let's see what else I can do. I can do transaction list, okay, by customer, right? And of course, we also dealt with sales tax. So you could deal with a lot of sales um, with your sales tax here as well. So under taxes, right? 
But yeah, it just depends on what position you have in the company and what um, reports are necessary for you because you're going to be answering or asking a specific question. So in this case, um, all of the reports are going to look standard like this. Okay, they're going to pull up the information that you want and it's going to look identical to this. So again, this is my sales report by item, right? If I do my customer open balance reports or open invoices, it looks the same. Okay, so once again, it's mainly geared towards people that are answering a specific question or asking a specific question about whatever position that they are in. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time um, going through every single sales report just because I don't know what your next position is. You could be, you could be an inventory manager. And then that way, your sales is maybe not as significant. Okay? So that's that there. Okay? Tomorrow, we're going to take a look at Chapter 5 and Chapter 6. So Chapter 5 is dealing with the bank reconciliation. So it's definitely something that we need to know um, for companies. And then we're also going to take a look at reports. Now, this is going to be reports based on the accountant. So it's definitely something you definitely want to learn in chapter six and know because again, if you are applying to be the general ledger, general accountant, you do need to know how to run these reports. And these are the most basic piece of information that you need to know, okay? All right, so that wraps up chapter three for you guys. Any questions in regards to chapter three? I'm assuming that's a no. No questions? Okay, so let's go ahead and do the review questions and you guys can go. All right, so question number one, customer statements. A. Okay, so Elena says A. Anybody else? A, perfect. A is the correct answer, right? It provides a summary of all the account um, receivables activity for each customer. Okay, good. Number two, okay. Um, which of the following options is not available on the available credits window? D. Um, use with receive payments. Yes. D is definitely not an option, right? We talked about this, right? First thing that you're going to do is give a refund, right? That means write them a check, give them their money back. All right. B is to retain an available credit, right? Such as a um, store credit card, right? You're giving them money so then they can apply it for the future purchase. All right. Or lastly, we can apply it to an invoice. So, yeah. So the correct answer is not available option is you can't use that for a payment. Number three. Okay. Okay. What is the best way to write off bad debt? B. B. Create a credit memo using the bad debt item and then apply it to an invoice. Yes. Yes, right? I showed you two ways to do it, right? And that's exactly what we did. We used a credit memo. So once again, the credit memo could be used for more than just returns, okay? It could use, be used to write off bad debt, okay? Number four, okay? In which of the following statements would you create a credit memo? All of the above, D. All of the above. Mm -hmm. Number one, right? Uh, when you need to record a cancellation. Yes, right? We talked about that. 
when a customer decides to call you and says, I want to cancel my order, and you've already placed it out, right, or you've already placed it as an invoice, you could just use the credit memo to um, essentially zero it out, okay? Um, B says, a customer returns, okay, merchandise. Yes, right? That's the whole purpose of a credit memo is to mainly focus on returning of merchandise. And then C, when a customer um, receives a refund, uh, I mean, re requests for a refund, yes, of course. If they demand the money back within conditions, then yes, you would use the credit memo for it, okay? And then last but not least, the credit memo number should be D, the same as the number um, used in the invoice with in which a uh, credit memo is linked to, followed by a letter C. Yes, so again, it's not you're not obligated to use the letter C. It just depends on what it is, right? Remember, if you remember my example, I used B for bad debt, right? But C for credit, okay? You could use R for refund, you can or revised, whatever you want to use, right? As long as that's what the, uh, you know, that should be, so once again, this is an, uh, an opinion-based one, that it should be similar to, if not um, a some kind of combination that has your invoice number that you're making a refund for with a letter, with a, some kind of a letter association that follows behind it. So in this case, they use the letter C. All right. Okay. Okay. So once again, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and let you guys.